Welcome to the Proceedings Podcast. I'm Bill Hamlet, the Editor-in-Chief of Proceedings at the U.S. Naval Institute. Today is Tuesday, the 21st of March. Good to have you on board, everybody. Uh, this show, this episode is brought to you by the members of the U.S. Naval Institute since 1873, going on 150 years now. The members of the Naval Institute have provided the basis, the, the foundation for everything the Naval Institute does, from professional books to the open forum of proceedings, to the USNI news team, to our members and uh, membership and conferences team and events uh, across the world. Uh, become a member of the Naval Institute, usni.org forward slash join and be part of the team. Okay, let's get to our guest now. Uh, joining us from Northern Virginia is retired Navy Admiral Sandy Winnefeld. He is, uh, uh, well, he's written for proceedings for a long time, and he's been a member of the Naval Institute, a uh, life member since probably the 1970s. Uh, but his most recent exploit is that he is the author of a new book from the Naval Institute Press. It is titled Sailing Upwind, Leadership and Risk, From Top Gun to the Situation Room. Admiral, welcome back to the show. Well, Bill, it's really great to see you again, and congratulations on 150 years uh, to you and Pete Daly, and uh, thanks for everything you do for the Institute. Uh, it's, yeah, there's it's a, a lot of planning. To keep reading. Yes, sir. Uh, so you know, you, you were on our, our board of directors from, I think, 2016 to 2022. And uh, right now, you know, one of the things that you're missing in the uh, the ongoing board of directors meetings is the planning for the 9 October event. So that'll be a big event in the Jack C. Taylor Conference Center uh, in Annapolis. Uh, it, we're not calling it a gala, but that's sort of the the vibe to the planning that's uh, that's happening. So very excited about And of about course, that. the conference center is named for one of my very favorite former enterprise sailors from World War II. So that'll be that's a terrific right. event. That's right. It'll be great. Uh, well, sir, you know, you were on the show. I said, welcome back. You were on the show <laughs> last time in July 2020. Uh, for our listeners who want to go back to episode 171 on the audio podcast, and we were talking about your proceedings article at that time, which was titled Winter is Coming. That was pre-COVID, before the Russian invasion of Ukraine, before January 6th, high inflation, et cetera. And I was just kind of wondering today, is winter still coming or we are, are we in it? <laughs> well, you know, uh, the article Winter is Coming, which is obviously uh, an allusion to the, the TV show, uh, was about a deteriorating security environment. Uh, where there uh, were forces out there uh, that are trying to unravel the global operating system as we know it and love it, that's kept us safe and prosperous for so long. And, and those adversaries are applying both symmetric and asymmetric military and non-military means to, to, against us. And we are largely responding with uh, demands for more means rather than looking at the problem as perhaps we need to rethink the problem and look for new ways. I think Ukraine has exposed a lot of this uh, in terms of uh, our response to that, what it's going to feel like. Uh, it's it's sort of a, almost a, it's not a free lesson. I don't mean to be flippant there, but it's an easier lesson than the China-Taiwan lesson would be if we will only see it. Uh, so I would, to answer your question, I'd say we're deep into fall uh, <laughs> and uh, we're not yet doing the things we necessarily need to do in order to uh, protect ourselves against a, a, a winter. Uh, but, you know, who knows, we may get there. We may get there. All right, so let's uh, let's dive into the book a little bit. So, sailing upwind. Just start with the title. What, what's the reason behind uh, calling your book "Sailing Upwind"? Well, you know, as a kid, I, I learned to race sailboats on San Diego Bay uh, as a you know a junior high school kid. And you know, when you're racing a sailboat, you're fighting wind and current. You're trying to make an object move against a prevailing force field. And I found that uh, frequently during the course of my career that I was pushing against a, an existing system, trying to change it, uh, starting as a young junior officer all the way up until I retired. And so it felt like uh, sailing upwind was an apt metaphor uh, for uh, to try to capture how I made it through my career. Agreed. Um, so let's start with a little bit of your, your early career. So you, you were a student at Georgia Tech, NROTC. You graduated from uh, from Georgia Tech, what was that, late, late 1970s, and yep. then off to flight school. So talk us through a little bit of the, the start with flight school. Later on, you went to Top Gun as a JO, um, sort of the sort of living the dream, uh, particularly these days as people think about, you know, Top Gun Maverick, and that's still yep. very much on the, you know, the American mind. 
Sure. You know, I, and I actually had a six month interlude uh, between when I graduated from Georgia Tech in 1978 and November of that year when I went to flight school, I got to be a sailing coach at the Naval Academy uh, on the uh, for the varsity yawl team. So I got to do a little more sailing upwind at the very beginning of my my career. But I did nice. did go to flight school, uh, got through uh, reasonably quickly at the time because there were a lot of pools and such. Uh, and uh, I just was lucky with the weather and that kind of thing and ended up uh, very fortunately along with uh, Bill Whiskey Bond being one of the first non-Sir grad folks to get to go fly the F-14 right out of flight school. And that was a dream come true. Uh, I had wanted to fly the F-14 ever since I saw it as a kid in Virginia Beach. Uh, it helped me get through college because I actually knew what I wanted to do when I graduated rather than kind of not having a clue. Uh, and uh, was fortunate enough to go to the, the VF-24 Fight and Renegades and had a, a reasonably successful tour, flew on the wing of a wonderful um, – former Top Gun instructor named Marty Chanik Streak, uh, who was my predecessor on USS Enterprise many years later. Yeah, uh, later, the second, second fleet commander, if I remember right. Was a uh, fantastic human being and a wonderful instructor and pilot. And uh, ended up uh, going to Top Gun as a student and uh, came back as an instructor, uh, which was, you know, I, I you go through that phase as a young tactical jet pilot and you're thinking, well, maybe I should try to be a blue angel or maybe I should try to go to test pilot school and I could be an astronaut or, or whatever. And I, you know, I didn't, I wasn't good looking or smart enough to be a blue angel. So, and, and test pilot school going to be an astronaut waiting for many years at the time down in Houston was not my idea. And I was always enamored by, by the notion of going to Top Gun and uh, rising to the top of the profession in terms of, of understanding how the thing worked. Uh, and I really admired the professionalism of the Top Gun instructors I had encountered and was very fortunate. And, and we, you know, I think I, I would tell you that every one of us instructors at Top Gun probably went to work every day going, how did I fool them into letting me become a Top Gun instructor? <laughs> um, but it was a really remarkable place to be. So when you got to Top Gun, it had been in existence for what, 15, 16, 17 years, something like that. This is yep. mid eighties. It was, yeah, it was probably started in 16, 17 years. Yeah. 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 And, um, were they, they, I, I, from your book, I know that you were flying a fours and F fives and not F 16s. The F 16 N came a little bit later, correct? The F 16 N came just as I was leaving and I, just missed having the opportunity to fly it. And I, I really, uh, it's unfortunate because I would have loved to fly that sweet little airplane. But it was fun enough flying the F-5 and, and the A-4. And I also got to fly the F-14 a bit uh, while I was at Top Gun. So flying three airplanes was a kind of a fun challenge. And I'll tell you that what I really got out of Top Gun was not only a, a really great education in, in the fighter business, it was a great education about culture. Uh, because the culture of the place is the best I've ever seen. It was, it was the inmates running the asylum. I guess we had a CO, we had an OPSO and all that, but it was really the young folks that were actually running the place. It was the most amazing example of positive peer pressure I've ever been around. There was none of this, oh, you're a try hard or you're, you know, you're working too hard making us all look bad. Every one of us went in there every single day trying as hard as we could uh, to, to make that mission come true of, of training uh, young men and women to be the best fighter air crew that could possibly be. And it was just an incredibly uh, enriching experience, both in the air and on the ground. So uh, people have been listening to this show for a couple of years now. We'll recognize we've had um, uh, Bus Snodgrass, a former Top Gun mm -hmm. instructor on the show. Uh, we've also had Pops Papayano, who was the CEO of Top Gun when Top Gun had its 50th anniversary a couple of years ago. We did a big 50th anniversary right. homage to Top Gun in the September 2019 <clears throat> issue of Proceedings. And we had Pops on the show. We were out at uh, out at Tailhook mm -hmm. uh, that year in Reno and, and Pops was on the show as we, we had that uh, issue of the magazine. And he was instrumental in helping us get a couple of articles about it. And I, to your point about the inmates running, you know, the JOs running the show, Pops said, and he was the CEO at the time. He said, you know, the CEO of Top Gun is actually like the least important guy there. You know, yeah. it's all the it's the, the JOs are the ones who are the subject matter experts who are doing the training, who are flying three times a day and, and that sort of thing. And the CEO's job is really to provide the, the top cover. Uh, yeah. One of the things that you 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 describe being a challenge at, at Top Gun is not only going out and flying these complex uh, hops, right? Sometimes, you know, four or five, six aircraft versus four or five, six or more aircraft. 
uh, three-dimensional chess game and mm -hmm. then remembering it well enough to come back and debrief it so that the students learn from it. And I, I thought that was just an amazing thing to think about. Okay, I've got to not only command my airplane, be, be with my wingmen or take care of my wingmen. I got to survive this fight, but then I got to come back. Can you describe that a little bit? Like, how do you learn uh, to do that? Sure. Uh, you know, when you're a, a pilot, let's say going through as a student, one of the things they try to teach you is a little bit about recall and, and not only the what, but the why behind the what. And you, you get to be pretty decent. And, you know, when I went through as a student, the five weeks that you're, we were privileged to be there. When you go to, to be an instructor, it's taken to an entirely new level. And you, there's a pretty extensive instructor under training syllabus there before they'll let you actually fly against a student or a, you know, a fleet, somebody in the fleet. And the emphasis really is on, on uh, not only professionalism in the air and the safety of the flight and the tactics involved, but also recalling what happened. And then reconstructing it on the ground. So you 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 learn a, a method, you know, whatever works for you best of quickly jotting down on an e-board what happened in a in a particular air combat engagement. You might have two or three of those in a given sortie, so you got to remember three of them. Uh, and you know, you little notations in shorthand, and then you you come back and quickly review them before you go into the debrief. And then you have to do a couple of things in the debrief. First of all, you're trying to teach somebody else to do this. Uh, which mm. is part of the, the the problem, but then you're trying to represent a three-dimensional battle space on a two-dimensional blackboard, and there's symbols and drawings that you can can do there, and um, you get you get to be pretty good at it. Where if you're in a one versus one engagement, for example, with another airplane, you can literally tell them within a couple of knots what airspeed they were flying at a given point in the fight, uh, just based on the angles that you see and all that. And then um, trying to make sure that the entire debrief is conducted in a uh, not the who in it uh, way so that, uh, you know, the egos are not fractured or anything like that. Because one of the best things about all of uh, American fighter aviation, whether it's Air Force, Marine Corps, Navy, what have you, is that we are very, very uh, critical of ourselves in the debrief, very honest and open and critical. But you can do that without putting the who into it. So you might find something like instead of why did you pull your nose up into the vertical there, it might be, so what was the F-18 thinking at that point when it's going up into the uh, vertical? Just a very subtle shift in tone to, to kind of take that unease of ego out of it. And you really now open up an enriched uh, learning environment there as to, to what really happened in, in an engagement. So it was really a skill that they pounded into you as an instructor under training. Uh, so you got good at it. How, how long are those debriefs normally? Like, talking 45 minutes, an hour or longer? <clears throat> Uh, at least an hour uh, for, a, for a good quality debrief. Uh, if you go out for a one versus one training engagement and, and you're not only uh, training a, a, like a, a, a pilot coming through the class on, on how, to, how to fight the fight, you're training them on how to debrief the fight. And you're also training them on how to actually run the entire sortie because you know, your first maybe one or two one versus one uh, sorties that when you're a student at Top Gun, the instructor leads. But after that, the student is expected to lead the instructor. And as an instructor, you'll intentionally make mistakes uh, to see if the student picks up on those, not only tactically in the air, but also in the debrief and how tactfully in the debrief they can debrief that mistake. It's really quite subtle uh, and, uh, mm -hmm. again, a very enriched learning experience. So you were there at Top Gun when they shot the original movie, Top Gun. Um, and uh, you, you, in the book, you mentioned uh, sort of making some judgments based on what you saw, like this is going to be a farce or something like that. And then later you saw it on screen and you thought, oh, maybe uh, maybe I was too quick to judge. So just yeah. what, what was it like to be there while, you know, and, and support the movie? I'm guessing all the pilots probably supported in some direction, uh, but then also to be kind of at the center of a, a Hollywood production. Yeah, it was, well, I think the most interesting thing for me was not necessarily the flying part of it or anything. It was actually watching these professional movie makers uh, on the ground. And they would say, uh, put together a scene where there would be a classroom and, and the classroom scene would be in, the, in a hangar uh, with an airplane in the background. And we would watch from a distance and go, these people are crazy. This will never work. It's, we don't do that. We, we teach in classrooms like everybody else. This is nuts. And then you see it on the screen and you say, you know, these people actually know what they're doing. And it really taught me a lesson of, 
uh, be careful about being critical of people who are in another profession doing what they do, because they're probably pretty good at it if they've reached that level. And you're just an amateur. <laughs> so, uh, but it was it was fun. And, and I also, uh, you know, people ask me about the second movie, the most recent one. And, you know, there are cringeworthy movement, moments in both movies, right? Where if you know the business, you go, oh, that would never happen. But yeah. it captures a lot of the feel. And the thing I think they did exceptionally well in the second movie was capture what it's like to operate, to fight an airplane under G. Because they had cameras on Tom Cruise and you can see his face, you know, under all his G. Right. Trying to manage, you know, an airplane, not hit the ground, don't run out of fuel, manage your weapon system, keep sight of the enemy, think tactically. And do it all under six or six and a half G's. I thought they did a really nice job of capturing that in the second movie. It was harder for them to do it in the first movie because they just didn't have the technology. Yeah, at uh, I guess it was la well the the last two times that there's been a tail hook convention out in Reno in person, they've had first they had the Hollywood presentation a few years ago before the, they had wrapped up the the production of the movie. Of course, then they had to wait because of COVID. And then last year, they had uh, all the Navy folks who supported the movie talking about, you know, the, the Navy's role in it. And, um, and both of those panel discussions were fascinating. But yeah. the, um, this past year, they had um, uh, the, the, the lead cinematographer, who's also a pilot, and the, you know, the, the tailhook folks who were part of it, the Naval Aviators, gave him incredible praise for how good a pilot he was. In designing, designing the shots, getting the, uh, the L thirty nine, I think it was the, the aircraft that had the special camera that did a lot of the air to air aviation, um, you know, in the right places at the right time. So anyway, just how they made the yeah. movie was the, the air scenes was. Uh, so, was so here's a little scoop, here. a little bit of a scoop for you here. Uh, so when sure. I was a young um, lieutenant commander uh, in VF one, and and we were arcing around off the coast of of uh, um, Iran. Off, off of Chabahar Airfield, and they had F-4s out there or something, and we were supposed to protect the aircraft carrier. It's kind of boring, right? So I started to write a novel, uh, and I never finished this novel, but it was a novel about a guy who has to jump out of his F-14 because he has a, a, an aircraft emergency, and his parachute mal his seat malfunctions, and it opens higher in the air than it's supposed to, and he drifts ashore into Iran. And so now he's evading... Yeah. And he's going to, uh, he ends up at the, at the fence line of this airfield, Chabahar. And lo and behold, there's an F-14 in front of him. So, of course, guess what he does? He steals the F-14. So I never finished the book, told a few people about it. you know. And then, you know, just before the movie was coming out, I started to get an inkling that, because the trailer for the second movie has an F-14 in it. I went, oh, right. no, they're not. They couldn't. They wouldn't. So just. Just because I did, I, I wrote that novel as a short story, submitted mm. it to proceedings, and you all published it online. It's called Reunion, and it's about right. a guy who, who uh, steals an F-14. And I got that out before the movie got out. Now, different circumstances. They weren't fighting or anything like that. It was you know an actually an aircraft accident. But right. uh, I wanted to get my stake in the ground that I had thought of that idea probably 30 years ago. <laughs> Yeah, drilling drilling holes in the sky off of uh, Iran in the what? They yeah. said early 1980s. Yeah, this was before we even went into the Arabian Gulf, right? It was bef before you know, Ernest Will and, and right. all of that. The hostage crisis was was ongoing. Uh, yep, yep. Well, sir, um, one of the things that that uh, struck me about your book because you talk about you know Top Gun and you, having squadron command and then commanding a ship a deep draft and then a, a carrier and a carrier strike group and then a fleet. And so, you know, your, your career is exactly what people s refer to when they say having command at every level. Um, so the questions that come to my mind are what's the difference? What, what did you find to be the differences or the commonalities in leading at those different levels, uh, you know, throughout your career? That's a, that's a really great question. And, um, that on the commonality side, I would say that the, the fundamental principles don't change. 95% of leadership is really fundamental principles, which, which I try to capture in the book and in these five anchors of leadership that I talk about and, and the, the sort of four threads that go along with each one of those. And, and those, those really, um, you know, I, I've kind of built those in my mind over the course of my entire career. And I still work on them. I'm still not the leader that I wish I could be. Uh, but in terms of differences at those different levels, you find that when you get into really senior levels, like as a COCOM commander, 
uh, or a fleet commander, the, your direct reports are much more experienced people. And, and that's mm-hmm. both a pro in that they bring a lot of you know, experience and seasoning with them and they can uh, address problems you know, uh, fairly quickly. But they also bring some you know, built-in biases and, and long-held habits and, and that sort of thing with them. But th- there is a little bit of a difference. You're dealing with a little different maturity level of, of direct report there. Um, and then the other thing is that um, there's a temporal aspect to this, that society uh, changes over decades. Uh, you know, the millennial uh, generation is a lot different uh, to lead than a boomer generation. And I really got into that later in my career when I was the vice chairman in terms of how I would um, uh, treat my junior officers that were on the joint staff and uh, trying extra hard to make them feel like they were part of the process, to allow them to challenge me and debate me in a safety zone, a comfort zone where they didn't feel intimidated by a four star. And you know, collaborating with them, literally fingers on the keyboard, that was a more temporal thing. I would wouldn't have dreamed of doing that when I was younger. Uh, it was just a different uh, generation that was being led. So, so uh, there are differences at those levels. But like I said, ninety five percent of it is fundamental principles. I'm I'm guessing that when you lead people who are also much more senior and seasoned, uh, if you're trying to lead change that perhaps they're not on board with or resistant to, that's a little bit of sailing upwind. That is exactly what sailing upwind is, uh, and and you know part of the uh, the change leadership piece is is not only trying to you know um, lead the horse to water. You know it's it's not a bad idea to let people think they're having the idea when it might you might have instigated it yourself a little bit, but it's also important to understand how to overcome resistance, uh, and and that has to be done. I think I I think of concentric circles of understanding. You know there's the sort of Ignorance, meaning not stupidity, but somebody just doesn't understand yet. They, they're not, they haven't been exposed to the idea yet. And then sure. there's maybe some denial. Another circle is denial where it's like, hey, this is too hard. You know, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. You know, you're just trying to make yourself look good, that kind of thing. And then there's sort of vicious compliance <laughs> where, okay, uh, I'll do this, but I'm going to show you how bad it is. And then there's sort of this, you know, uh, well intended misapplication where people start to think, hey, this actually is a good thing. And they think they've got it, but they don't quite have it. Mm-hmm. Uh, and, and then there's, you know, this sort of now they get it and it's embedded in their body of practice and they become a champion. Well, I found that when I was, whenever I was talking to somebody about change or being talked to about change, I wanted to understand what circle that person was in because I would talk to them differently. Uh, there's a different conversation you have with somebody who's a vicious complier than there is with somebody who's in their well-intended misapplication phase. So it changes, changes a lot of fun. Um, and you're absolutely right. The more senior people get, it can be a little harder for them to adjust to new ideas. Did you find that uh, leader, leading at those different levels, uh, you know, squadron, ship, CVN, strike group, numbered fleet, et cetera, did you enjoy it at more at one level or another? Was there a leadership tour that you're like, that is that was the best job I ever had? And another one where like, uh, I wouldn't I wouldn't redo that one if I didn't have to. Yeah, I think you know the the, the shore a shore-based leadership job I had at Joint Forces Command was a job I'd never want to go back to. I was leading uh, uh, senior civilians who who were at each other's throats and it just wasn't an enjoyable experience. Uh I, I think the the most uh challenging and fun at the same time leadership job I ever had was being the captain of USS Enterprise, just because mm. it's just, there's just sheer adrenaline uh, when you're at sea. There, you know, it's a 24 hour a day job. You're leading the most amazing department heads. They're at the p- pinnacle of their profession. Uh, the, the young kids out on the flight deck and in the nuclear propulsion plants, it's just an exhilarating experience to do something at that scale. Uh, but leadership is good. Run to the sound of the guns, man, because leadership is fun. Um, you, you know, your, your title is leadership and risk from top gun to the situation room, white house situation room. Mm -hmm. And I really enjoyed that paragraph, especially. And a a lot of our listeners, particularly young people, I know when I was an ensign, probably up to being Lieutenant commander, I had no insight at all into that level of decision-making. And you point out that you were privy to uh, meetings in the white house situation room, probably 1200 times or so in your career. And I was wondering if you could just sort of explain the process a little bit and then describe how do a lot of the talking heads get it wrong? 
Yeah, you know, it's really fascinating to plunge into that process and see how the sausage is really made on on the highest level of national security decision making. You know, are you going to rescue a hostage? Are you not going to rescue a hostage? You know, whatever. Uh, compared to you know what perception was that I had before I got in there, and it really, for one thing, you know, there are different layers of meetings. There's the policy committees that are you know sort of the worker bees, and then there's the deputies committee where a lot of the work gets done because you've got the deputies of all the departments, you know, secretary of state and all that, and then the principals, and then the NSC, which is the the president. But what was interesting to me, I, and I, I was in that space in both the Bush administration and the Obama administration. And I worked with some of the most amazing civilian people in government that I've ever worked with from both administrations. They were very talented, uh, worked their tails off, very dedicated to the safety and security of this country. And in many cases, most cases, they, they thought a lot alike. You know, the politics were sort of outside the room. So that was a, sort of a pleasant surprise. And then uh, I, I really came across the notion that when you're sitting at the end of that table in the White House room, you're the president, let's say, it's a completely different viewpoint. The campaign rhetoric is gone. The media is gone. You are you now have in your hands the, the lives of young Americans uh, who could potentially be fighting overseas. You have the future of the country. You know, it's a very serious place where very serious decisions are taken. And one of the things that uh, you, you asked about where the talking heads get it wrong, you know, most of them have never been in that sit room. Even some of the retired military folks you see on TV have never been in there. And they don't realize, for example, the importance of international law uh, where, you know, there are, now, without giving you a tutorial, there are really only three instances under international law where you're allowed to use force. Uh, one of which is, of course, self-defense. Another one is when you have a UN Security Council resolution and that sort of thing. But most people never think of that. They just sort of throw out these flippant comments like, hey, let's go just do this. Well, if you do that, and you do it outside of international law, then you're inviting other countries like Russia, like China, to also operate outside international law. And it's a real restraint. And just about every meeting I ever went to in that room had a, you know, a, a, a segment devoted to the lawyers talking about what's legal and what's not legal about what you're talking mm -hmm. about doing. Uh, one of the reasons we had so many meetings. But, uh, and so the talking has just completely missed that. They really don't have any understanding of it. What were, you know, one or two meetings or, or issues that, uh, you know, that perhaps our listeners would, would remember back to uh, that happened in your time when you were the vice chairman of the Joint Chiefs, you know, sitting in the sit room? What were, what were a couple of those big decisions that you were part of the, the conversation with? Well, there were a lot of them. Uh, among them were um, what we were going to do about uh, Syria when Syria started falling apart. And, you know, uh, Assad was killing his own people. Uh, and, you know, there was an awful lot of pressure for us to you know, do something. Well, international law makes that very, very difficult for you to go interfere in another inside another country, a sovereign country. And so we were looking for ways to get that done uh, in, in, a, in an overt way rather than a covert way. And those were some very, very difficult decisions. And then uh, right in the middle of that, ISIS happens. And now you have Iraq and Western half of Iraq has fallen and everything changes because we can now um, actually defend, you know, we have Iraq asking us for help. So now we're allowed, it's, it's a collective self-defense thing. So, so a lot of those types of decisions, um, but, but probably the most uh, interesting ones for me were when we wanted to go either capture a terrorist or rescue a hostage. And that's where uh, my interplay was between the special operations community and essentially the White House. And, and I, would, I was expected to go in and describe to people who were not steeped in military affairs how we were going to go about getting this job done and what the risks to the mission were and what the risks to the force were and all of the ancillary details to satisfy them that giving a yes to that operation uh, was the right thing to do. And we, we all, all of these got a, a yes, except for one time when we got a no and the secretary of defense uh, said no. And then after, you know, when that decision was rendered to even further build their confidence in our special operations forces, we would take a, an operator and some communications gear into the White House and we would allow them to watch overhead video of these operations. And I allowed them to do it under one caveat. You, know, you can ask any question you want to ask, and I or the special operations person here will try to answer it, but you can't ask any questions downrange, and you can't 
give us any direction downrange because the thing is going to happen and the last thing they need is us talking to them right now. And they respected that. But it, watching the professionalism of our forces on the ground really built their confidence uh, so that they were more willing to approve the next one. Uh, and so that was sort of an interesting part of that whole process. But all kinds of different meetings, as you can imagine. Yeah. And uh, you, you point out well in the book, I, I thought that, that, you know, when you have uh, a deputies committee, as you said, so that's, you know, in your capacity as the vice chairman of the Joint Chiefs, yep. you were a deputy, right? The chairman right. is a is a principal. The right. NSC is the president plus the principals. And yes. sometimes those those working level meetings and so on, on the on the counterterrorism side as a counterterrorism steering group, right? Uh, secure, mm -hmm. Counterterrorism security group meeting right. before a deputies right. committee. So sometimes those meetings, um, a, a meeting convenes, a recommendation is made to go up to the next level. And then you might look at it at that level and say, no, no, we're not ready for prime time and push it back down. So sometimes mm -hmm. an issue can go up yeah. and down the level of yeah. uh, sort of chain of command or chain sure. of meeting, if you will, before you ever get to a, a decision, oftentimes and, many times, right? And it sounds like it sounds like uh, you know a, a system designed for paralysis, but in fact, it's a system that really is uh, sometimes catches really important things that uh, that that were not thought of. You know, when you have some pretty smart people in the room that are coming from different disciplines, Treasury, State, they'll ask a question. You go, oh, you know, okay, uh, good point. We need to go kind of work on that. And, you know, it, we didn't get get sent back to do our homework very often on those kind of things. But some of these are very difficult issues. And the one thing I will say is, is that domestic politics never came into it. There never once in all those thousand or so meetings did I ever hear somebody say, well, you know, if we do this, then it's going to help us with the election or anything like that. It just flat was not in the room. Now, maybe it happened outside the room. I don't know. But it was completely professional inside the room. And the closest yeah, we would come to you, that is like, is how is this going to play with Congress? Yeah. yeah but, yeah. you know, th that wasn't a political thing. It was like, hey, are we going to get any green? And let's make sure we inform Congress of this thing we're about to do. Uh, so pretty interesting. Yeah, definitely. Um, so we're running a little skosh on time here. Just uh, last couple of questions. So your book, you, you mentioned five different leadership anchors. Uh, right. What are they? And could you describe, you know, one or two of them in depth? Yeah, the anchors are what, uh, you know, I believe that leadership, learning about leadership is, is requires study. It requires observation of good and not so good leaders. And it requires, you know, obviously your own running to the sound of the guns and doing it yourself. But I think it really helps. It helped me, it helps young people learn about leadership to have some kind of a framework on which to hang your knowledge. And I developed a framework over my, you know, 37 years in the, in the Navy that revolves around the five anchors you mentioned. One is leading yourself. Another is leading people. Another is leading organizations. The fourth is leading execution. And the last is leading change. And each of those has a rich set of subordinate threads that, 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 uh, that are very important to that particular discipline. Just to pick one, which I think is the most important one, is leading yourself, because you, you can't lead anything else until you, until you, you know how to lead yourself. And the, and the, the four threads there are uh, essentially character is everything, which, in, you know, the character in, involves, you know, integrity, uh, courage and humility, real humility, not, not false humility. Uh, it involves lifelong um, learning. Uh, uh, for example, if you're a lifelong learner, both deeply and broadly uh, outside your profession, then you will be able to lead change a lot better. So these things are interrelated. Uh, another very important one is, is commitment. At some point in a young person's life, they have to decide that they're going to be committed to something. And, and it doesn't mean committed to becoming an admiral. It means committing to what you're doing every single day uh, and being the very best you can at it. And, and that kind of committing, your, you know, really being all in on a profession is very important, I think, to be a leader. And then last uh, but least under leading yourself is, is managing your own brain. And by that, I mean uh, managing stress. Uh, and that sort of thing. And, and um, you know, we in naval aviation have a have a way of doing that, of sort of compartmentalizing and putting things off in a little box, because when you're trying to land an airplane on a carrier at night, you don't want to be thinking about your finances or your parents health or your relationship. But there's a lot more to it than that, you know, uh, exercise and, you know, eating well and all that sort of. But but managing your own brain is very important to be a leader, because if people see you under stress visibly, mm -hmm. then they are going to be stressed. If they see you 
in a, in a intense situation and you're just this island of calm, well, that's going to have an enormous calming effect on your organization. So uh, it, it's not to be neglected. So leading yourself was uh, the first and most important, but the other pillars are, are also very important as well. Great stuff. Um, Our last question, uh, you have a long connection. I mentioned it earlier in the show uh, with the Naval Institute. It, that connection started pretty early. Um, you mentioned that uh, you you got to spend some time coaching sailing at the Naval Academy after you finished uh, um, NROTC at Georgia Tech. And you met my predecessor, uh, Fred Rainbow. Tell that story a little bit. Yeah. So when I was, a, 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 I guess, a freshman or a sophomore at Georgia Tech, I kind of got the the itch because uh, I had done fairly well in English at, at my high school and I kind of got the itch that I wanted to write something. And because my dad had written a couple of things for proceedings, I said, hey, you know, I'm going to try to try to do that. And he go, Castor, what am I going to write about? Good heavens. Uh, I can't think of anything other than ROTC recruiting. How do you bring people into the program? So I wrote this article on, on it and went up there and met this very young editor at, at the Naval Institute named Fred Rainbow. Uh, and and Fred helped me with that article. And uh, it wasn't a very good article. I'll, I'll be here to tell you right away. One of the things I really applaud about the Naval Institute is it supports young writers in developing their skills as writers. I think that's terribly important, a wonderful service that the Institute provides. And, and Fred did exactly that for me. And it, it really taught me a lesson that you can think well and not write well, but you cannot write well and not think well. Uh, and Fred kind of led me down that road. And I'm very grateful to him to this day for kind of getting me started on that and how you approach this kind of a problem. I, Fred and an English teacher I had in high school were my two heroes in terms of learning about writing. Uh, so very grateful to him. Well, I would also point out it's uh, very cool in my mind, the fact that your dad uh, won the general prize essay contest. You later uh, won the general prize essay contest. I think you were a lieutenant commander. And then your son, LJ, who's a Marine captain, I believe he he's written for us three or four times, but he won the CNO Naval History Essay Contest a couple of years ago. So having three generations of Winnefelds uh, in our pages, is uh, that's a pretty cool thing. Well, I'm really, I'm proud of my dad. I'm proud of my son. Uh, you know, he does this on his own. He wanted, he wanted to do it. He realized the value uh, professionally of, of gaining writing skills. And so he's, he's been off doing that. And I was really tickled that he won that uh, history contest. That was pretty cool. Yeah, that was very cool. All right, sir, we're about out of time. Uh, any saved rounds or parting shots from you? No, just uh, uh, thanks again for what you do. Congratulations once again on 150 years of the Naval Institute. You know, I, I started reading proceedings probably in 1962 when I was a little kid. Wow. And I will never forget, I think it was 65 or so, the, the you know, USS Enterprise was on the cover of National Geographic, but there were also articles about it in proceedings. And, and, you know, maybe I was looking more at the pictures when I was a kid than I was reading the articles. But it was in my blood, and uh, it's really, really great to see the Institute thriving uh, today. And so congrats to you and Pete Daly and the whole team. Thanks for what you're doing. Well, thanks for being on the show, sir, and congrats on the book. The book is titled Sailing Upwind, Leadership and Risk from Top Gun to the Situation Room by Admiral Sandy Winnefeld. Sir, always great to have you on the show. Uh, wonderful conversation today. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Bill. It's good to be with you. All right. Well, that wraps up another episode of the Proceedings Podcast brought to you by the members of the Naval Institute since 1873, bringing an independent open forum for the advancement of sea power. To become a member, go to usni.org forward slash join. If you enjoy the show, ring the bell, subscribe to our channel, tell your friends. And until next week, remember, victory begins at the Naval Institute.